Hi everybody, my name is Doug Barr and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. The Forum is an educational nonprofit with a mission to inform, entertain, and inspire by presenting artistic performances and exchanges of creative and innovative thinking on a wide variety of humanities-based subjects. The Forum is an all-volunteer organization and if you're interested in becoming a member, please visit shforum.org. The world, as most of us know, is changing, and people and animals and ecosystems are suffering. But according to our next guest, human beings can create and sustain a world in which wild species thrive in natural spaces and where people are healthy and happy. To find out exactly how that might be accomplished, we've invited Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist David Freed to have a conversation on our behalf with Dr. Beth Shapiro, author of Life As We Made It, How 50,000 Years of Human Innovation Defined and Redefined Nature. Dave Freed is a screenwriter, author of the best-selling Cordell Logan novels, and a former investigative journalist for the Los Angeles Times. He was an individual finalist for the Pulitzer Prize's Gold Medal for Public Service, the most prestigious award in American journalism, and chaired in the Pulitzer Prize for the newspaper's coverage of the 1992 Rodney King riots. Dave reported from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq during Operation Desert Storm. He's a frequent contributor to national magazines, including Air and Space, Smithsonian, and The Atlantic. He holds a Master's of Liberal Arts degree from Harvard University and currently teaches creative writing at the Harvard Extension School. Dr. Beth Shapiro is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Shapiro's work is centered on the analyses of ancient DNA. Dr. Shapiro was a Rhodes Scholar, was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, otherwise known as a Genius Grant, and was a Royal Society University Research Fellow. Shapiro was appointed a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow at the University of Oxford, and in the same year, she became the director of the Henry Wellcome Biomolecule Center. While at the center, uh, Shapiro carried out mitochondrial DNA analysis of the dodo. Shapiro's research on ecology has been published in leading journals, including Molecular Biology and Evolution and Science and Nature. In 2007, Beth was named by Smithsonian Magazine as one of the 37 young American innovators under the age of 36, and in 2010 was honored as an emerging explorer by National Geographic. Everyone, please welcome Dave Freed and Dr. Beth Shapiro. Hi, Beth. Hi, Dave. Thank you for being with us today at the Forum. Nice Thank to be you. Here. <laughs> We've all been looking forward to listening in on your conversation. So if you're ready, Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Beth, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, just FYI, I was a uh, biology major for about 20 minutes in... Um, actually, that's not true. I was a biology major for about a year in, in my freshman year in college. I learned more reading your book, vastly more reading your book than I did in that entire year. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, curious, what made you switch? Am I allowed to ask the first question? <laughs> sure. uh, well, I, I my, my, my GPA and my, my realization that I was never going to get into medical school, so I had to find something <laughs> oh, else. No. Uh, I discovered beer too early, and that was not a good thing. Um, anyway, uh, I, I am curious, what what uh, compelled you? What led you down the path to becoming uh, an evolutionary biologist? Oh, I think a, a little bit of chance and a little bit of, of luck. I was actually a, a geology major when I was an undergrad at the University of Georgia. And I did that because I started off as a broadcast journalism major. See, we, we did this little swap here. And um, I took a class the summer of my freshman year, which was in the, it was for kids in the honors program. And it was to study geology and anthropology. And it was an amazing class. We started off and spent a week on the east coast of the continent. And then we drove across the country, spending the night in national parks and tents, and then worked our way up the west coast and then back across the middle of the country. Nine weeks camping, sleeping outside and learning about the geological history and anthropological history of the U.S. And I decided, you know, rather than be a, a regular broadcast journalist to take these classes, I'd already been working professionally a bit as a journalist. And so I 
understood some of what I needed to understand to, to try to get a career going in that direction, I would take science classes and learn about science and maybe become a science journalist uh, specializing in telling stories about biology and evolution and geology and earth sciences. And so that, that class really inspired me to do this. And I... I've always intended to go back to science journalism, but it never really worked out. I just keep having exciting opportunities to go do research. When I was an undergrad, I had an opportunity to go live in Panama at uh, Barro, Colorado Island Research Station in the Panama Canal for a year. And I went down there and learned about a new culture, learned a new language, and got to do some hands-on science and really just found it amazing and ended up you know, thinking, what did I want to do in my life? Um, while I was down there, I met someone who was about to start a lab at the University of Edinburgh, and I was fascinated by the research that he wanted to do. And so we decided that we would write all these applications that I could go be a grad student in his lab. And I did not get the fellowships that I would have needed to, to be there, but I ended up getting a Rhodes Scholarship, and, and that meant that I was going to Oxford. And I wandered around Oxford, a little bit sad that I wasn't going to be in this lab in Edinburgh, but super excited to be at Oxford. I met somebody who had just started a lab there who said, you know, if you join my lab, uh, you can go to Siberia. And I thought, eh, what? that's a pretty reasonable reason to follow one's career trajectory or to shape one's yeah. career trajectory. Actually, it isn't. But um, <laughs> the, the work that he was doing in ancient DNA, it was one of the few labs in the world at the time that was able to do this. There's some special technology that one needs to extract DNA from the remains of things that used to be alive. And he was building one of the only labs that would exist in the world at the time. And it also combined my interests in geology and in earth sciences and ecology and evolution, um, because one could use genetic information from the past to understand how these big processes, like um, the increase of the, 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 the the ice age, you know, the, the increasing glaciers on top of the continents and then the shifting climates associated with this and then the rapid warming period after that, how these big picture processes impacted the evolutionary trajectories of the plants and animals that we see today. So I was super excited about getting into this field at the very early stages. And yeah, so that's a long story from broadcast journalism to geology to ecology to evolutionary biology, but I guess it's really a trajectory of of identifying exciting opportunities and just following them. So well, there's an absolute, you know, <laughs> logic to that trajectory. Um, <laughs> you, you, you talk about in your, in your book, uh, life as we made it, um, a, a, a lot of those big picture processes, obviously. Um, and I, 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 and it's, it's just a fascinating read. And what was particularly impressive to me was how, uh, even though I did have that one year of expertise as a biology major, it was written in a way that I didn't, it was, it, it made complete sense. I didn't feel like I was being talked down to. And yet at the same time, you, you presented very uh, technical information that, that I thought made those big picture processes very relevant. Oh, that's um, flattery. Thank you. That's, oh, sure. <laughs> that was my intention, well, obviously. So thank you. Yeah. So my, <laughs> I, the, I thought that the, 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 perhaps the most salient, uh, the most salient element of the book came on, on page 200, 280, when you write that if we want enough food to feed nine or 10 billion people, as well as breathable air, drinkable water, and biodiverse habitats, then we need to control, we need more control over evolution. What does that mean to the average person? I think um, when we think about evolution and we think about nature, the average person tends to imagine this as a process that is entirely random and out of our control. And in fact, the objection that most people have to biotechnologies that, uh, that do things like um, introduce cloning or gene editing or genetic engineering is that this is somehow taking away this naturalness, this simplicity that really runs the rest of the world. But in fact, the whole history of our species has been us trying to take that randomness away so that we can better control this process and make the world that we live in better for us. Um, first through domestication and agriculture. This is when we, 
when we took um, tesinte and turned it into corn and we took aurochs and we turned them into cattle, um, we were directing the evolutionary process in a very specific and controlled way. And when we started conservation, a lot of people think of conservation as standing back, stepping back, allowing nature to take its course rather than you know, getting in the way and really making it more of a human process, when in fact, it's not that at all. Um, when we, for example, decided to save the, the Florida panther, we did this by controlling who got to breed by moving individuals from Texas into this Florida population by determining which individuals, how many individuals can survive, where they can live, et cetera. We are taking control of this process so that this species has the chance to survive with us. Um, we have in fact become our own sort of evolutionary force. Evolution still works in the same way. Evolution simply says that those individuals that are born, that are more fit than other individuals in their generation, that are better able to find the resources that they need to eat, a place to sleep, a mate, those are the individuals whose genes are going to be passed to the next generation. This is still true. What's different is that what makes an individual more fit is its ability to survive, to thrive even, in a habitat that is completely dominated by people, which means that they have to do something, something about their behavior and physiology and phenotype, the way they look, the way they act, has to be something that we like, that we approve of, that we say, ah, that is what should get passed on to the next generation. So I think this is, this is really what I mean. Uh, we're facing right now a so many crises, uh, crises of, of confidence, crises of clean water, crises of clean air, uh, crises of extinction. And in order for us to be able to deal with all of these crises, we need better control over the physical and the living world around us. And we will do that by better controlling the evolutionary process. But um, I, you make a very persuasive argument in your book that um, I think it's since the 1500s, the rate of extinction among species has increased 20 fold. It would suggest that whenever and, and you also make a persuasive argument that whenever whenever uh, Homo sapiens have shown up or our predecessors, things have oftentimes not gone well um, for for other other species. Um, parenthetically, I also thought it was kind of intriguing. I, if I, unless I got this wrong, I think you said something like 40% of the, the species that have gone extinct since the, since the, uh, the 1500s were, were snails and slugs. And I found that kind of curious given that you're a professor <laughs> at UC Santa Cruz where the, where the mascot, if I'm not mistaken, is the banana slug. How do you care to respond to that? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure that 40% of species that have gone extinct are snails and slugs. Maybe it was that 40% of snails and slug species have gone extinct. Oh, maybe, maybe that's it. Like that. I, and, and I, I don't mean to be flipped, but, but, but I, I, I am, I guess the question, the, the more serious question in that is, I, I think it's, it's beyond dispute that, that oftentimes our interaction uh, species to species has not gone well as we've yeah. attempted to exploit plant and animals for our own benefit. So, uh, you know, obviously there's a cautionary tale in this. I just wonder how, how much of the, of the, the warning is, is getting through to people who, you know, who survive on a sustenance basis or people who are perhaps not as enlightened about, you know, our symbiotic relationship with the environment. What do, what do we, how do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah, I, I think what you're what you're hitting at is that there's a, there's a there's an intention that is associated with our actions, right? And um, in the beginning of the book, I talk about the very first way that we as people have been um, influencing the evolutionary trajectories, the futures of the species around us, was to drive them to extinction. And there is a clear correlation between the timing that people first arrive in the particular location during the out of Africa exodus. Um, and the disappearance of mostly large mammals. This is what we can see from the fossil record, large mammals and large birds, megafauna from these habitats. And the, the challenge has been that oftentimes this is also associated with really rapid changes in local climates. And so disentangling these two impacts, is it people who drove these 
species to extinction or is it because of habitat change in the region or is it a combination of these things has been very difficult to tease apart. And I have no doubt that in many places it actually really it is a combination of these things. You know, climate changes are happening and species are pushed to the brink of their capacity to survive. And just at that really bad time, people turn up in the landscape and wear the proverbial straw that breaks the giant camel's back, as it were. There was a giant camel that lived in North America that went extinct in the Pleistocene, the, the last period of ice ages. Um, what's different about today, and I think one of the reasons that we see, well, there are probably several reasons, but one of the reasons that we see so many of these extinctions happening in things like snails and insects is that we're, we don't know about it. We don't, we don't understand that we are causing these extinctions in these groups of in these taxa. When, when people first arrived in Asia or on New Zealand or on Mauritius, they didn't plan to make the large species that were there become extinct, right? And once people realized that their actions were causing extinctions, they changed what they were doing. They modified their behaviors. In fact, this is how we have the origin of livestock. People who were living in the region of the Levant and in Africa saw that their actions were driving these large aurochs to extinction. And they thought to themselves, that would be terrible for me. And I don't have to kill everything that's out there in order to keep my family fed. In fact, what I can do is change my hunting practice. If, in fact, I leave the females behind and the young males and just take the older individuals and non-reproductive females, that means that those animals will be there next year for me to keep hunting them. And so we began to change the practices by which we were hunting, eventually brought things closer to human settlements, eventually started making more informed decisions based on reproductive biology and understanding animal behavior about how to maintain these herds. And it was our ancestors noticing that their actions were driving species to extinction that caused the changes in human behavior that brought us domestication, domesticated animals. And I think conservation has really done the same thing. As soon as we start to notice that these things that we like in, in North America, the turn of the 20th century is associated with the birth of the conservation movement, which was really driven by hunters who realized that things like passenger pigeons and bison were becoming extinct and decided that if that happened, they would no longer be able to hunt these animals, which they still wanted to do. And so they started to devise legislation and regulations and hunting tickets and things like this and helped to to bring up to to begin this conservation movement which was again selfish we, we realized that our actions were causing some harm and decided to change our behavior for the purposes of, of course for us today we have more of an appreciation of nature for its own sake rather than for the services that nature can provide to us at least those of us in privileged situations of being able to do this do and again we're trying to figure out how it is that we can change our behaviors to protect and preserve wild species and and native ecosystems but we aren't noticing yet that what we've done is kill so many slugs and snails and insects and smaller things and as our acknowledgement of this increases i think we will again be able to change our behaviors and think about what we might do to save these species so, so how do you oh, i'm sorry no go ahead um, so how do you how do you then um how do you then uh, address the that that quadrant of of our society that uh, whenever there is like legislation put in place to defend some endangered species, inevitably the argument is that somehow this is this undermines the potential of people to earn a living, and that why should we care about the spotted owl or the delta smelt? What what? How do you how do you make relevant? As from a from a biological standpoint, how do you make relevant, arguably the 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 relevance of an inconsequent an inconsequential species, like, you know, not a domesticated cow that that you know, how, how do you how do you deal with with that argument that like why should we care about these things? Yeah, well, this is you know a fundamental question of our day of our time. How do you? There's so many industries where we need people to understand the bigger picture impacts of what's happening, you know, burning fossil fuels and deforestation and preserving individual species in a habitat. I think really what it takes is 
you know, open communication, acknowledging that people have different perspectives that they're coming from and really trying to help people to understand on their own terms how species interact with each other in a habitat, in an ecosystem, how you can't have an ecosystem that is just cattle and grass because eventually it will all die. You know, it's not a long term, it's not a sustainable product and you can't lecture at people. You have to engage people in things that, that they understand, that they're willing to understand. And I think, you know, we have a, a long history of this being this being something that we can do. People, I think, don't naturally want to think that they're killing things, that they're destroying habitats. And for the most part, anyway, there probably are people out there who don't care and we just can't talk to them. Um, but I do think that there's a, there are people out there, I don't even want to say a new generation, because I think that all of the generations of people are capable of respecting and understanding that ecosystems are rich and diverse and that can be they can be thrown out of whack by um, by removing components of that ecosystem but helping people to understand how everything interacts that things are there are food webs and energy webs and if you remove some small component of it then that really might cause a problem with uh, with everything else so yeah it's a hard question it's definitely a hard question yeah, and it's an abstract. It's an, I think for many people, it's an abstract concept because it's like you know. I'm mean, going back to the reference to snails. It's like, why should we care about snails? How does that, you know, how do they play into the whole food chain? And I don't eat snails, and you know, <laughs> what, what, what does it matter to me? I don't eat snails either, and I have a nightmare, a recurring nightmare that I've gotten up and I'm stepping somewhere, and I step on a slug, and it squishes in between my toes, and I don't know. I'm just like I've. I once, when, I, when my kids were in preschool, um, they had a, a banana slug. You've already mentioned the banana slug, but they had one living in a little terrarium in their preschool. And they also had all these little toy banana slugs for some reason. And I saw that one of the toys was stuck in the, the, the runner of the sliding glass door. And so I went over and I picked it up to put it back and it was the real one. And it was just, it was so sticky and slimy and gross and it was cool. And I'll give you that, like they're big banana slugs and bright yellow and I put it down and it took a lot of soap to get the banana slug slime off of my, off of my hands. Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge fan, although I do understand that they, <laughs> are important to the ecosystem. You know, they are they are eating stuff and helping with that recycling process of turning decaying matter into something that's going to grow up again. And we want to keep them. They're really great. I just don't want to touch them, really. <laughs> I, 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 I probably would concur, all things considered. Um, it's a it's a cliche, perhaps, but you know, there there obviously is truth in the notion that uh, we study uh, history to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Um, how does our study of, of evolutionary history square with the, the looming frontier of bioengineering? That's a big question. What, what do you what do you mean by that? Um, um, how does our study of evolution square with bio bioengineering? Do you mean how? Right. I mean, we 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 started out. I mean, with a recognition, we you know, as a species, started out obviously with a recognition that if we if we bred this particular individual animal with that particular individual animal, we would come up with a particular result that might benefit us. Maybe it's a, you know, it it it's a a, a, a cow that gets fatter quicker, or it produces more milk, right. or a bigger chicken with a bigger breast, or whatever. Um, and now it would seem with with uh, with DNA manipulations, we, we have the potential to to be a little more overt in um, in in those outcomes. And I guess I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is what what lessons do we learn from the past as it relates to that very rudimentary process of generationally? altering a species versus taking the DNA from that species and boom, turning it into something <laughs> that it wasn't two generations ago. I, well, I think there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So um, what the bioengineering, and there are many different forms of bioengineering right now. So I think the most, the, the simplest form that people are using is we're able to go into the, the genomes of cells. If we understand what the DNA sequence is doing at a particular place, and we know that a tweak that we can make to that DNA sequence, and the simplest thing to do right now, for example, is to turn a gene off. 
um, or to, and I can explain explain that a little bit more, then, then we can get to an outcome really quickly. So if we understand from, you know, generations of breeding selection, artificial selection, that if we take two individuals that look a way that we want them to look, and we want to combine those traits, that we can breed them together, and maybe some proportion of their offspring will have that combination of traits. And we don't have to understand why genetically, the link between what's in their DNA and what their phenotype looks like, but we also have to accept that we might not get there quickly, we might not get there at all, that because we're just randomly combining two genomes, the offspring are going to have 50% from this genome and 50% from this genome, and it might not be the right 50% that we're thinking about, and we might have to do many generations of breeding them in one direction in order to get this phenotype that we want. What uh, breeding selection using genome engineering or bioengineering lets us do is if we understand the gene that we want to change, and this is a big if, because for most species, we have the whole genome sequence, we've read the DNA on a computer and we can write it down, but we still don't know with good confidence what all of, where all of the genes are, what each of those genes is doing and how they're interacting with other genes. But there are some special cases where we do, and we can use these technologies to get to that phenotype in one generation, and without any other changes. So um, an example, for example, of how, uh, of something that we might want to do is there's a, a Japanese firm that's just created a new tomato that is gene edited tomato that makes this heart healthy you reference this in your book, protein. I, I don't think I talk about it in the book, actually. I think it was you, you, after I had done this. Um, you, talked about, you talked about tomato. I talked about the flavor saver tomato. This is an the older one. That's, this that's, new that's, tomato is really new. It's within the last oh. within the last year or so. And what they've done is, is there's a there's a there's a protein in tomatoes that uh, is good for your health. For good for your heart, the heart healthy protein. I think it's GABA protein. I'm not entirely sure what it is without looking it up now. I should have looked it up before having this conversation with you so I could talk about it, but eh, bygones. Anyway, um, this protein, what happens normally is it's produced to a certain level, and then another gene in the tomato genome turns on and shuts off production of this heart healthy protein. So you only ever get this amount of heart healthy protein. What these scientists have done using genome editing is they've turned off this other gene. So this one produces this much. It doesn't trigger this gene to be turned on, which stops the production. And so the tomato just keeps making more of this heart healthy protein. And so you end up with a tomato that is three times as much of the heart healthy protein with one change, which is just turning off a gene. There's no genes from other species being moved into this tomato. It's not a, it's not a transgenic, genetically modified organism. It's just one change change to the genome that turns off this gene that makes this tomato that has this phenotype, makes a load of this heart healthy protein that we think is good. So could we have gotten there in nature? Maybe if enough random mutations were made to this genome over and over and over again, we might have gotten to a point where one of those mutations turned off this other gene blocking the production of this. And then you ended up with this heart healthy tomato. But because we were able to understand, scientists were able to understand what genes are associated with this phenotype. And we have technologies that allow us to tweak the genome in this very specific way, we can make this change. So one of the ways that we find new phenotypes of plant species that we might want to eat is we use what's called mutation breeding, radiation breeding. We take the plants and we grow them up and we zap all the plants with this load of UV irradiation or with chemical mutagens to make their DNA change as much as possible. And then we grow them up and we pick the things that we like and we say, oh, here's a new variety that we have created in nature because we haven't done any DNA manipulation. We've just zapped them with a whole bunch of things that make them mutate loads of times. Each of these plants probably has tens of thousands of new mutations, but the phenotype is something that we like, right? And lots of things that we eat are made from mutation breeding. Um, renin wheat, brown rice, ruby red grapefruits, these are all products of mutation breeding, right? Um, and this, by people who are anti-bioengineering, think, people think is okay. But these same people would say that the reason they don't like bioengineering is because there might be an uncharacterized mutation in there caused by this process. This seems to me to be an example of how people just don't 
haven't been given the opportunity to really understand what it means to do the bioengineering versus these other things. A ruby red grapefruit, which has a little sticker on it that says non-GMO project verified, right, um, has tens of thousands of uncharacterized new mutations that were introduced by stuff that we did to it. But it's okay. But this tomato that makes a lot of heart healthy protein that has one mutation introduced to it, that is too scary, right? So I, I think, and I mean, I understand that people are nervous about things that they don't understand, and that is completely justified. People should be nervous about things they don't understand. But I really wish people had more opportunities to learn about these technologies and what they mean and what they don't mean so that we can really make informed, genuinely informed decisions about what we want to buy and not buy, rather than go buy this little green sticker that kind of doesn't mean anything. I mean, salt has a green sticker on it that says non-GMO. I, I, <laughs> I wonder, I mean, you draw that distinction as far as the ruby red grapefruit and the, and the tomato that's, you know, uh, that's been substantially modified by these, by these various processes. I, I wonder though, whether those people that are fearful of, you know, GMO, uh, uh, products would would balk if they knew that that's that, that that those steps were involved in in delivering that product to their produce section at the grocery store. Well, maybe, and that is just backing up my point that this little sticker that goes on stuff is not actually giving people choice, is it? Um, it's not telling them how that product was actually made in a way that they can make a decision about whether they feel comfortable with that. So how I'm playing devil's advocate here for a moment. How do you how, how then um, do we uh, how do we square that whole concept with the with the notion that we are we are trotting on the, the providence of of the divine that really we have no business messing around with things like this, even if it's to our greater benefit, even if we get more heart healthy protein out of our tomatoes, it's it's really not. It's not. It's not our. It's not our purview. I think that, that should be. Yeah. That, that's a higher authority's responsibility. Well, I think. How do you, how do you respond to that? Argument? <laughs> I think we just have to point out that people have been messing with everything that we eat, everything that we rely on for for our uh, sustaining our life right now for a very long time. That since the beginning of agriculture 12,000 years ago and probably longer than that, we have been making decisions that have impacted the direction and rate at which the things around us grow. And if we're going to say we don't think humans should have intervened in anything, then we don't get dogs and we don't get horses as we know them and we don't get our pet cats and we don't get corn and wheat and all of the things that we rely on for our society. And what we're trying to do now is use biotechnology, different biotechnology than was available to our ancestors, but biotechnology that we developed using our brains, which we evolved, <laughs> um, that allow us to make more with less, that allow us to grow more food on the same amount of land that we're going to need to feed more people, that allow us to protect and preserve ecosystems so that we have natural systems that we can enjoy, that we can explore, and that we can capitalize on, right? There are everything, every decision that we're making is really to sustain people. And if we want to reject these sorts of innovations, then we have to live with those consequences. And those consequences will be that we cannot sustain the 10 billion people that are going, that are projected to live on this planet in not very long. So we must either adapt these new technologies in a way that we're comfortable with, which means we have to spend some time educating people in a way that meets them where they are about what these technologies are and aren't, or we acknowledge that people are going to die. And I would rather live in a world that is biodiverse and filled with happy, healthy people than a world filled with suffering where all of the space is taken up with our domesticated species. Yeah, you, 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 uh, just as an aside, what's fascinating and uh, among many other elements in the book, you, you, you talk about the evolution of, of cattle, the domestication of cattle and how many species of cattle there are. I mean, I think it was, there are three times as many 
species it's, of cattle yeah. as there are dogs. Breeds, yeah. So oh. the cattle are all the same species, and species is oh, like a human my, construct, my breeds, right? Breeds, but it's okay. Breeds. But yeah. yes, so many breeds of cattle, and there are so many cattle. <laughs> there are so many cattle on this planet, right? And they are responsible to their farts and burps, burps mostly, um, for a lot of the methane that's getting pushed methane, into the yeah. atmosphere. So cattle... Cattle are great, but they do a lot of damage as well. But there may be ways that we can manipulate them to make them more efficient users of their intake so they can expel less of it into the atmosphere. I mean, this is a, a pipe dream for the moment, but these are some of the ideas, some of the ways that our biotechnology can help us. And we've already changed cattle to the extent where they can produce way more milk and meat with the same amount of nutrition than they did just a few decades ago. Um, imagine what we might be able to do as we better understand how cattle genomes work to make cattle physique and behavior and to learn to better control that using biotechnology. Well, so you're going to have to help me on the math here and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. But I mean, one of the questions that wasn't answered in the, in your book was you, you talked about the domestication of cattle and then if I'm not mistaken, it, it took us 2000 years to figure out that cows could be milked. Um, why? <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I, I don't know that that's true. I think it's just in the archeological record. We see the first evidence of dairying uh, some, some time after. I'm sure that the people who were using cattle initially were using, were using milk in some way or another. I mean, one of the things that had to happen is that um, people had to evolve the ability to continue to digest milk uh, after weaning. So in, in mammals, all mammals, including us, um, mo the wild type phenotype is that one can drink milk until they are weaned, and then the ability to drink milk disappears. And, and most people, the, I mean, the default in people is the inability to, to drink milk or lactose Yeah, I was, I was surprised by that. It's the norm to be lactose intolerant. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, and then yeah. mutations arose in people people in several different places in, on the planet um, several times. And because dairying was already around or because cattle were around, we still don't fully understand, these mutations provided an advantage to the people who had them because they could continue to digest milk. And that mutation became uh, passed on to the next generation more and more frequently until today we see a pretty wide distribution of lactase persistence. Lactase is the enzyme that is made by our bodies to help to break down lactose, which is the sugar in milk that if you're if you're lactose intolerant, you can't break down that enzyme. And so your gut microbes try to do it, but sometimes they don't do it very well and it causes bloating and pain. And, and those people who are lactose intolerant, I am increasingly lactose intolerant and I'm actually a heterozygote for this. I have one gene that makes me able to digest milk and another one that doesn't. And so I think I'm, you know, as I get older, I become unable to do this, which is a shame because I really do like cheese and ice cream. Not a huge fan of milk, but cheese. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like I like it all, and I'm I'm right there with you. And I've recently discovered lactose-free milk. It's like it's like it's like guilt-free. Um, um, can, let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, there there much has been made in in a correlation of sort of DNA extraction and and manipulation with this whole concept of de-extinction and let's bring back the woolly mammoth, which I think we could all agree would be totally cool to have woolly. <laughs> And That's I, a good place think, to start. Yeah, it'd be and cool. I think, there, I think you, you allude in the book to somebody who, who actually saw a certain utility to bringing back the woolly mammoth and, and the and ecology and so forth. Um, but you, you also make the argument that you don't think that, it, at least in the case of the woolly mammoth, that it's a very, that's a very practical <laughs> project idea. Right. Why? Yeah. So, I mean, I actually, my first book was called How to Clone a Mammoth, and I, I go into this in, in some detail. So if you're interested, there's a how-to manual out there. You know, it's, it's been out there for a few years. Um, you know, for every species that has been proposed as a candidate for de-extinction or bringing back after extinction, there are different technical, ecological, and ethical challenges associated with this process. Um, and I, I, focusing just on technical challenges, because I think this is kind of an interesting way to think about it. I mean, it's, it's obviously easy to think about the ethics of this. Should we do this? Should we not do this? And there's different ways to approach that. But technically, just is it possible to do it? With mammoths, um, the first thing you, you would need to do, okay, first of all, when, when people think about 
de-extinction, the first thing that normally comes to mind is cloning, you know, this process that brought us Dolly the sheep, right? Um, and this is a actually a technical process known as somatic cell nuclear transfer. And the way this works is that our bodies basically have two types of cells, somatic cells, which are all of the cells in our bodies, heart cells, skin cells, liver cells, brain cells, et cetera, and germ cells. And that's a sperm and eggs, the, the things that would normally be fertilized and it creates a zygote that goes into the embryo, et cetera. Um, so what normally happens in order to make a new organism is the egg is unfertilized and the sperm fertilizes it. Each has one copy of the, the two of the chromosomes, right? So you end up with a zygote that has two copies of the chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad, and that grows up and that's fine. In somatic cell nuclear transfer, rather than fertilization, what you want to do is take a somatic cell that already has both copies of the chromosome, one from its mom and one from its dad, and use that as the starting point. So that's how you end up with a genetic clone. You're just using that somatic cell as a starting point. The way you do this, you take the living cell, you put it in a dish, you starve it of nutrients to stress it out. You harvest an egg cell from a donor and you remove the genetic material from that egg cell so it's empty. And then you put these starving somatic cells next to this empty egg cell, zap them with electricity so the membranes open up and the genetic material from that somatic cell goes into the egg cell. So now you have what looks like a fertilized egg, but rather than getting one copy of the genome from mom and one copy from dad, it got both copies from that somatic cell, right? Zap it again, the proteins in that egg cell cause that cell to forget all of the instructions necessary to be whatever type of the somatic cell it was. There's obviously instructions because, you know, you need different genes to be a skin cell than a heart cell than a liver cell, et cetera. So you got to forget those instructions, revert to this early type of cell that can start to divide and differentiate and become every type of cell that makes up an animal. That's how this works. So you start with a living cell and this is where it goes wrong for mammoths, right? There are no living cells. Mammoths have been gone for more than 3000 years. The most recent mammoths were alive in Wrangell Island just around 3,200 years ago. And they're dead. There are no living cells. So we cannot clone a mammoth, right? Step one, technical hurdle. <laughs> yeah, that, that would seem to be a problem. So we need a living cell. So where do we get a living cell? We get a living cell from an Asian elephant. This is the closest living relative of the mammoth. They diverged around five to six million years ago. Um, their genomes are about 1% different from each other. Their genomes are four billion letters long. So 1% of 4 billion is the number of differences that we would have to change. That's a lot of things, right? About 40, maybe it's one and a half percent, 40 to 60 million changes, right? That's a lot. Okay. So then we go out to the field in Siberia and we collect some really well-preserved mammoth remains. We extract their DNA. We sequence their genomes, which we can do. We've done this. And then we line them up on a computer, right, against the genome of an Asian elephant, which we've also sequenced, and we figure out where those 40 million differences are. We can do this, right? This is a thing we can do. Then we have to figure out how to edit the genome of that Asian elephant cell that's growing in a dish in a lab to contain those 40 million differences so we can gradually cut and paste our way from an Asian elephant genome to a mammoth. Can we genome. do that? We cannot do that. No, that is too many changes at once. We can make a few changes. Um, and, you know, George Church, who has a lab at the Vice Institute at Harvard, has recently founded a company, co-founded a company with Ben Lamb, who's a tech entrepreneur called Colossal, which, you know, is a synonym for mammoth, right? Pretty cool. <laughs> Um, they're both adjectives, right? Um, yeah. Colossal. <laughs> colossal, yeah. Um, and what they're trying to do is to, to figure out this next step. So we can't make 40 million changes, but it's probably true that not all 40 million of those differences are important to making a mammoth look like a mammoth compared to an Asian elephant. So one of the first steps is to narrow that down. Which mutations might we make? And George, before joining uh, with Ben was working on this and he had focused on, he and his team had focused on genes that are involved with 
um, phenotypes that might make this tropically adapted Asian elephant better able to survive in Siberia, in the cold tundra. So genes associated with having more and longer hair or thicker layers of fat or this kind of thing. And they'd made about 50 changes to, to these cells growing in dishes and labs and Colossal, the team there, are now working to identify you know, what, what other changes might be useful, how can we validate these changes and make sure they're there. So then you would have a cell growing in a dish in a lab. That is not a mammoth, it is a cell growing in a dish in a lab. So what do you do next? Well, now you have to transform that cell into a living animal. This is just cloning. This is somatic cell nuclear transfer. And if it were a sheep, we would know how to do it. It's an elephant, so we don't really know how to do it. But here we're into reproductive biology realm. So the technological hurdles here are, how do you do um, this sort of reproductive biology on an elephant? How do you get an elephant egg cell? How do you implant an embryo into this, the, a surrogate mom elephant and then go through the process of growing up that animal and then having it be born and having it then learn how to be a mammoth when it's growing up with a family of, of elephants? So there's a lot of technical downstream stuff there too that we just don't really know how to do. But what, I mean, and I, and I get, yeah. I, I, and I guess the, 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 the sixty-four thousand dollar question as it relates to that is what what is the pragmatic what is the the pragmatic value in doing this? I mean, if if it's against the backdrop of how other than as a novelty, yeah. if the, if the if the intent here is the manipulation of of species to to our you know collective benefit, what value is there in this notion of which which seems to you know if you if you Google it, you'll find all kinds of references to you know, as I'm sure you, you have about the, the notion of, of, of creating a, uh, recreating a woolly mammoth. I, what is the, what is the value there? What do we get out of it? Yeah. Well, uh, this is a good question. I mean, George Church uh, is, has been working with um, Sergei Zimov, who's a biologist with the Russian Academy of Science for many years. And Sergei, Sergei and his son Nikita have a, a huge plot of land up in Northeastern Siberia called Pleistocene Park. And um, they would love to have a mammoth reintroduced into Pleistocene Park because they see a mammoth as playing a foundational role in this ecosystem, you write about this that. community yeah. that used to be there. Yeah. Um, so they have woolly, uh, woolly horses and, and uh, you know, the, the Przeworski's horses and uh, bison and a couple species of deer. And what, what Sergei has shown, so his idea is that you know, the permafrost is a uh, is melting because of of global warming, and while it's melting, there are gigatons of carbon that are being released from these soils because it's just full of organic material. And as it decays, it just gets released into the soils, and it's a huge source of methane for greenhouse gas emissions. And so his idea, Sergey's, is that if we can reestablish the community of animals that used to live in permafrost regions, that that can slow the rate of permafrost thaw. Now, this sounds counterintuitive, but this is the way it works. So during the winter, the snow covers up the permafrost and snow is a hugely efficient insulator. And what it does is it traps that summer warmth in that permafrost and it causes the temperature to never cool down. And so gradually over time, the temperature of the permafrost increases and that's why it's melting. But if the animals are there, they have to eat which means they have to pull the snow away from the surface of the permafrost. And when they do that, it exposes the dirt to this really cold Siberian winters and actually freezes the sediment again from the top, these soils again from the top. And so with the animals present, clearing away that snow actually reduces the rate of permafrost thaw. And he's done experiments in Pleistocene Park where he measures the subsurface soil temperatures in places that have animals and don't have animals. And it's shown that this is true. The, the subsurface soil temperatures where animals are present can be as much as 10 to 15 degrees Celsius colder. Um, than the subsurface soil temperatures where the animals aren't there. So he believes that bringing mammoths back will, you know, because elephants are foundational to their communities in Africa. So why wouldn't it be the same for mammoths? We can really reinvigorate these communities, reestablish them and help control global warming. Is this reasonable? I mean, I'm less confident than he is about the scope for uh, the, the reduction in permafrost thawing with de-extinct 
mammoths than he is. Um, I think if we really want to be doing something to control global warming, and we should, we should be doing something, thinking about things with a much more proximate win, because, you know, elephants are very slow reproducers. It's going to take at least a century before we have enough mammoths to populate even a small amount of Siberia, assuming we get through all these other technical hurdles. Right? So, so why couldn't you introduce, I mean, you, 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 um, you have wonderful uh, anecdotes in your book about extracting bison, bison bones, you know, prehistoric bison bones from Wyoming and places like that. Why couldn't you introduce a different species? Why couldn't you introduce why couldn't you introduce bison to? They, they have. They have bison, yes, uh, from Canada that they've brought there. And But their argument is that mammoths were foundational. They need these big animals. Okay. I, I, you know, I'm... I, I don't know that this is this is really necessarily the reason that we want to have mammoths back. I think people want to have mammoths back because they were really big and it's exciting. And as soon as they realize we can't have dinosaurs, that's where their mind goes. Um, and and we really, can't we have dinosaurs. Wait a second. What about Michael <laughs> Crichton? Michael Crichton said we could. No dinosaurs. No dinosaurs. Sorry, there's no di there's no DNA left in any any of the non avian dinosaur bones that are out there. Right. So they're rocks. There's no DNA in rocks. But. Um, so uh, just going back to what you talked about, attempting to, you know, marry up the, the 40 million differences between um, between a woolly mammoth and, and, and an African elephant. Um, if you have if you have a species of animal like a sheep, like a dolly, um, and you have obvious available to you active active DNA, um, what precludes the scientific community? Uh, and I'm probably misstating this, but wh why couldn't we why couldn't we find the perfect the perfect specimen, the perfect dolly, uh, the perfect cow, the perfect whatever, and just simply reproduce that you know, reproduce that animal ad nauseum to our benefit? With, you know that a a a um, uh, an animal that's been modified to produce like ridiculously low cholesterol laden meat or whatever. I'm, well, we can. I mean, why, why, can't, why can't we do that? We can. <laughs> That's just that? cloning, right? That's just cloning. That's, why, so why couldn't we do that though on a wholesale scale? Well, I don't, I mean, what be the implications when, when we're of cloning that, for yeah. a very specific trait, you know, if there's a, there's a company called Boya Life that I think is in China that's attempting to clone the perfect Wagyu beef cattle, right? And they want to make hundreds of thousands of them every year because they want to sell them, which is fine, right? If, if this is for this particular thing, but then you are really removing any sort of genetic diversity from your population. And as long as nothing else changes, as long as there are no new diseases or the climate doesn't change in an unpredictable way or the food source remains the same, then probably you're okay. But if everything is a clone, and a disease comes in that those clones, that particular genotype is not fit against, then everything dies. And you go from having your hundreds of thousands of identical cattle to having none. This is one of the reasons that having genetic diversity is something that when we think about protecting populations that are out there, we, we measure the amount of diversity that's there and hope to improve that. Um, and so we don't really want everything to be identical. If, if humans were all identical, First of all, it'd be really boring, right? We don't want everybody to be the same. <laughs> well, unless you're a megalomaniac, probably those people want everything to be just like them. But I think most normal people would want some diversity out there in the world. But, but isn't that isn't that sort of the slippery slope that we're talking about here, or that the, that the naysayers um, are are fearful of? That you know, it, what what's to it's it's a it's a thin line between modification of of um, animals that we eat or plants that we eat and modification of human beings is to it, create. Though, you know, I'm, to... I'm not sure it really is a thin line. I think there's a pretty thick, enormous line between uh, modification of plants and animals and modification of people. And this is an ethical line, right? But this right, was the line that was, was crossed uh, when um, he Jiang Qiu, uh, gene edited the, the, the two girls, the twin girls, and he announced to the gene editing community expecting celebration and fanfare. And everybody was like, absolutely not. This is not something that we do. Now, and one of the reasons that I think that we draw such a clear ethical line between modifying other things and modifying us, I mean, apart from that, we've been modifying other things in, in different, less direct ways for you know, thousands of years is that we, we imagine these other things that we're modifying as 
as destined to play a particular human created niche in the world in which we live. You know, we recognize that we have created chihuahuas and and created, you know, Alaskan sled dogs for different human niches. You know, one of them is to pull sleds and another one is to, you know, ride in your pocket, you know, or and yip at things, right? These are, and we don't have a problem with this because they're they're falling into these niches, right? But people don't belong in niches. People are supposed to have free choice. People are supposed to be able to make decisions for themselves about what they want to do and what they want to be. And that, I think, is why we have such a, an ethical dilemma with using these technologies to modify us, um, because it takes away the freedom of choice, which is what we associate with us, but not with other species that we interact with. And I, you, but, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. But you, but you also have, I mean, again, you're speaking of the, the ethics and this whole, you know, this whole new, new, brave new world. Um, the idea that uh, let's say you have, you, you have, um, you know, someone who is, who is genetically predisposed to a certain disease uh, and you, you selectively determine in vitro, whether the, the fetus is going to be carrying that, that same gene. Um, I mean, again, it's, it, it I, I do think that it is, um, it's, it's a, it, it's arguably a fine line between making those determinations and and creating potentially not, not with great uniformity. You know, everybody's going to look the same and have the same capacity to run a hundred meter dash or something. But but I mean, it, it it's just it raises all kinds of interesting and and in an arguably ominous ethical questions. Yeah, I think they are interesting ethical questions and certainly questions that we should discuss before it's possible for us to do these things, which is why it's good to have these conversations now. But I would still argue that there's a really big difference between doing genetic engineering or gene editing of people for health reasons um, versus doing it because we imagine some phenotype that we like, you know, some particular way that somebody looks or some behavior that they can have. But what's interesting about that sort of thing, your, your, your phenotype, is that this is not something that remains constant, but normally is bounded by how common something is. Normally, it's the least common thing that is the most popular thing. And I imagine that if we got into the state where we're modifying everybody to look one way, because that's the most popular thing in this generation, by the time you get to that generation, it's not going to be popular anymore. Instead, it's going to be something else. I mean, we're fickle in that regard. And so phenotypically, physical stuff, characteristics like that, I mean, we can imagine the situation where we, where this had become really important, but I, I doubt that it can. I mean, even if people started selecting for one um, biological sex over another, when the other biological sex becomes scarce, then that is the biological sex that's going to be more popular to have. I mean, it's a, I don't know. Yes, these are definitely deep and interesting and fascinating ethical questions. And I, I don't personally know what it's going to be that pushes us over that line to modifying humans, but I doubt it's going to be chasing some, you know, some phenotype that's, or some, some grand thing that uh, somebody perceives is going to be better. Cause that's not how evolution works. You know, evolution just selects for the thing that is the most fit in the time in which it lives. To my mind, what's going to happen, the thing that will push us over the edge is that there is some pandemic that's different, that's worse than the pandemic we have today. And we don't have vaccines or treatments or any or ways of, of dealing with this. And we learn that there's a certain section of the population that is going to die because of this pandemic, because of some genotype that they have. And we know we have this technology to save their lives. Suddenly, the thing that is ethically the, the scariest, most objectionable thing out there will be the only ethical solution to this dilemma. And that is what will push us over the line. Um, not chasing some sense of beauty or speed or physique. That, that, the, the prospects of that are, are disconcerting, I'm sure, to say the <laughs> least. Um, let's talk about, uh, we have a, just a couple of minutes left. Um, let's talk about, a, uh, from my perspective, a less disconcerting issue, namely meat, <laughs> namely steaks, prime rib, and so forth. Um, there, there is that there is that community that argues that the idea of raising cattle for human consumption is environmentally really dumb um, and just not sustainable. Um, with with uh, the introduction of these various products, plant-based products that emulate the, the, the taste and the texture of meat, 
will will we in the future here's a predictable a, a predictive question will we in the future be able those of us who enjoy you know a good piece of prime rib once in a while will we be able to enjoy prime rib in the future i think we will never entirely get rid of animal products they're culturally important to lots of different cultures they're you know i, I do think that part of being able to feed 10 billion people with the amount of space that we have will have to involve cutting back on the amount of meat that we consume because it is environmentally inefficient to feed people using animals that also have to eat and where you know where there are so many people but i don't think we'll remove it entirely i also see a future where we might be growing better quality meat in vats using actual cells of of animals rather than using yeast to and we're doing that animal now, proteins right? and yeah and that's that's beginning right now and there is a and what do we call those are those plant based products or are they animal based products so it's a is a new exciting world out there i i do think that we will have to cut back um, I do think that it's going to be important for people to adopt diets that are more environmentally sustainable. And I'm excited about the prospect of all the biotechnological ways that we might be able to do this so that we can still have it that every now and then we might be able to. Well, I will say that the products, you know, the Beyond Beef or there, I can't remember the, and the, the name. And the Impossible Foods. And yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, I think they're absolutely very, very good. I'm, I'm, I'm and very, getting very, better. Yeah. And getting better. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I really thank you so much for for uh, for taking the time. It's been uh, it's been enlightening. And, yeah, thank uh, you for your time. It's been it's been fun. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you both for a really fascinating conversation, and thank you all, wherever you may be in the world, for being with us today at the forum. To learn more about Dr. Shapiro's work, please visit the UC Santa Cruz Paleogenomics Lab at pgl.soe.ucsc.edu. It'll be written on your screen. You can find Beth's latest book, Life As We Made It, online or at your local bookstore. To find out more about Dave Freed, visit his website at david-freed.com. Over the past several months, in addition to Dr. Shapiro, the St. Helena Forum has presented programs including Alexandra Cousteau discussing renewing the world's oceans in just one generation, Janet Eilber, the artistic director of Martha Graham, the oldest dance company in America, Dr. Kara Cooney introducing us all to female pharaohs in ancient Egypt, Dr. Avi Loeb discussing his controversial theory about a recent interstellar visitor, and Margot Lightman and Dr. Jonathan Adler teaching us all how to become practitioners of the historic art and science of storytelling. Our audiences have joined the forum from all over the world for these presentations, and there are more programs to come. But first, we're going to hit pause for a summer hiatus. We'll be in touch, though, through our website, shforum.org, and we'll look forward to seeing all of you again in a couple of months. And finally, as we say goodbye, we'd like to thank the following people for their generosity in making the St. Helena Forum and its continuing programs possible. Mm -hmm.